Louis, a Midwestern city with a Southern accent, the gateway to the West. Polite, friendly, where we desperately need to know where you went to high school. However, St. Louisans aren't without a touch of cynicism. Us show me state citizens usually tend to keep our business to ourselves. We have secrets. We have secrets beyond, y'all cats ain't got a clue why the cutlass blew. There's a dark side, dangerous secrets, known only to dangerous people and their victims. So lace up your Air Force Ones, grab a plate of toasted raviolis and a Bud Light or a cup of water, same thing. We're gonna talk about a few of the most disturbing and brutal unsolved cases from Murder City itself, St. Louis, Missouri. February 24th, 1981, the body of a woman was found at the foot of the Poplar Street Bridge in East St. Louis, Illinois. And even considering the crime in that area, that is a crazy place to find a body. The victim had apparently been tortured and strangled. She was later identified by a friend as 24-year-old Sharon Hurley from 4111 Russell Boulevard in St. Louis. She was found at 8.10 p.m. in a grassy area near concrete bridge pilings by railroad detectives who were driving on a private road checking out some boxcars. Scratches and bruises on the body indicated that Sharon had been choked, beaten, and burned on the face. Even her pubic hair had been singed. Some of the scratches on her body were thought to be made by long fingernails, indicating that a woman may have been involved in the crime, but more than likely, it was probably Sharon herself who had made the scratches while struggling against a ligature or her attacker's hands around her neck. Almost as if someone had been watching, a few minutes after the body was found, an anonymous caller phoned the Soje, Illinois Police Department to report that he had seen someone in a light blue car stopped on the bridge and throwing a body over the railing, which had to be the craziest thing that dude had ever seen. Sad. Traces of blood were found on the eastbound bridge railing at the southbound Illinois Route 3 exit to Cahokia. And I think what makes it even stranger is that is very trafficy. There are several exits that go lead from the Poplar Street Bridge. The Cahokia exit is a little more narrow with most of the lanes going north. So for someone to stop right there, it had to block up traffic for a while. An autopsy indicated that Miss Hurley was killed by strangulation and not from the fall from the bridge. The St. Clair County coroner had reported that it was probably just a very short time from when she had been strangled to when her body was found. So that means if they were heading east, that the crime probably happened somewhere, either downtown St. Louis or to the near north or near south side, which again, tons of people around, but no one saw anything, I guess. Neighbors of Miss Hurley were interviewed, but they really didn't know that much about her. She had only moved to St. Louis two years ago from Massachusetts. They knew that she worked as a waitress and sometimes a sex worker, which unfortunately would make this case a little more difficult to solve because she was probably killed by someone she didn't know. Miss Hurley had a six month old daughter at the time of her death. Her daughter is grown now and she has no memories of her mother's voice or her face, but she's still looking for answers. She runs a Facebook group called Justice for Sharon Hurley. She had been active about 10 years ago on web sleuths and she seemed to be getting stymied. They weren't even sure what jurisdiction the murder fell under. Um, she had also reported that there were several records that were actually stuck in an abandoned building in East St. Louis that no one could get to. Her daughter lives in Massachusetts now, so it's probably even harder for her to get her hands on any information or to get any help, which is really sad. There are no suspects and the anonymous caller who had reported seeing someone in a light blue car throwing a body from the bridge has never been identified. It might seem strange that there was only one phone call and considering it was in the evening, early evening, there should have been tons of people around. Cell phones weren't a thing and 
that's kind of just how it went back in St. Louis in the 80s. See something, don't say nothing. And it doesn't appear that this cold case is actively being worked on and anyone involved in the murder could be long since deceased or moved from the area. So unless someone acting on their conscience calls a tip into the police, this case may never be solved. On February 1st, 1968, two local men decided to go fishing. One of their favorite spots was out in St. Charles County at one of the several sloughs off the Mississippi River on Missouri Route 67, just across the Clark Bridge from Alton, Illinois. Not really having any luck, they decided to try another spot. But as one of the men were leaving, they caught something out of the corner of their eye. When he turned to look, he saw about 15 feet from the shore what appeared to be a black box tied with rope. So of course he moseyed over to check it out. And as it turns out, it wasn't a black box. It was a cheap black suitcase that had been tied with blue clothesline rope. And two barbells had been tied to that rope. Inside, he found the decomposing body of a child, a toddler, two to four years of age, clad only in white underwear. She had also been tied up with the blue clothes on and two more barbells had been attached to that rope. An autopsy was performed upon the body of the little girl with the long strawberry blonde hair upon being brought to the St. Charles County Medical Examiner's Office. They learned that Jane Doe had died a few weeks to a month prior to being found. So probably late 1967, early 1968. There were no signs of trauma to the body and the body did start to show signs of discoloration. And while the autopsy failed to disclose the cause of death, it had been deemed a homicide. While not a lot, there was a little water in her lungs, which hadn't ruled out that she had still been alive when she'd been tied up in that suitcase and callously dumped in that leg. Following the autopsy, a Don Mobley of St. Louis asked the St. Charles police officers if he could see the body. He thought Jane Doe could be his missing three-year-old daughter. His daughter, Teresa, and another sibling had been taken by his estranged wife when she disappeared to be with another man. The following day, the coroner said that Mr. Mobley feels as confident as he can without being absolutely sure that it's his daughter. We can't accept that really, the coroner said, not without proof positive, but it's not unreasonable to think that the body had been in the water for several weeks, so it's not unreasonable that Mr. Mobley couldn't identify, but people do that, unfortunately, parents, hook up with someone who maybe doesn't want a toddler and this is a, a way to get rid of her and it had been generally thought that this was a child that really wasn't cared for and someone had just dumped her like trash you have diane downs susan smith so that's a big question mark for me on february 7th the still unknown little girl was buried in an unmarked grave in the baby section of the oak grove cemetery in 2015, investigators exhumed her remains in an effort to find more clues about who the little girl was and maybe how she died. Unfortunately, any DNA extracted was insufficient for profiling. The following year, in 2016, the St. Charles County Police Department held a graveside service for the child. Thanks to the kindness of the detectives working on the case and the citizens of St. Charles who were heartbroken over the tragedy, Jane Doe, West Alden, rests beneath a headstone breeding. Blessed child of the St. Charles County Police Department, February 1st, 1968. 54 years later, Jane Doe, West Alden, remains unidentified. Although Linda Sherman had been missing for five years previously, June 28th, 1990, Two ladies lunching at the Casa Gallardo in Bridgeton, a St. Louis suburb, noticed a human skull appeared to be staring at them from the bushes. Although police were immediately called, the skull ended up on a shelf in the morgue after it was assumed that it was a prank and the skull came from a recent cemetery relocation project. Thanks. 
I'm surprised that really didn't happen. On April 22nd, 1985, Linda left work at the U.S. Government Records Center at 2.16 a.m. She returned to her Vanita Park home and fell asleep on the couch. Later that morning, her husband Don took their daughter Patty to school. Patty had noticed her mother lying unmoving on the couch and was surprised because her mother normally takes her to school and she didn't even wake up to say goodbye to her. Don reported seeing Linda leave for work at 6 p.m., although no other witnesses reported seeing her leave the house at all that day. Five days later, Linda's Volkswagen was found abandoned at Lambert Field Airport in St. Louis. Don theorized that Linda had ran off with another man, but Linda's family knew that she would never leave her daughter Patty, even though the marriage had apparently been on the rocks. 14 months after the skull was discovered in the restaurant in Bridgeton, an anonymous letter was sent to the Vanita Park Police, stamped in purple ink, and it said, Bridgeton Police have L. Sherman's skull. Don. Forensic tests would prove that it was Linda's skull. Investigators believe Don Sherman exhumed Linda's remains so he could place the skull where it would be found. It was thought that Don needed his wife to be declared legally dead so he could get remarried. The Casa Gallardo was Don's favorite restaurant. That's nice, Don. That's classy. Don Sherman remains the prime suspect in his wife's murder, but without evidence, there have been no arrests. Don remains a free man, and the rest of Linda's remains have never been found. A flapjack. Heather Kalorn was just 12 years old when she went missing on July 15th, 1999. Heather had been babysitting for family friends Dana Madden and Christopher Herbert. Dana had been at work and Christopher was partying with friends. Partying with friends turns out to be making <laughs> with friends in a nearby garage. <sighs> Around 2 a.m., neighbors heard a baby crying out of control. They went to the apartment where Heather was babysitting and they found Heather gone. A witness reported around midnight, he was out walking his dog and he saw an unidentified man carrying a child about Heather's age wrapped up in a blanket. Dana Madden later reported a floral comforter was missing from her apartment. A small amount of blood was found in the apartment and it had been linked to Heather. I think that's a lot of clues. I think, I think we know what happened here. Police believe Heather witnessed some illegal drug activity, possibly coming from the Muslim. that was discovered in the garage nearby and was then abducted and murdered. Heather has never been found and no arrests have been made. The case remains unsolved. If you made it this far, you're bananas. Also, thank you. I wanted to make this video because these cases are so cold and I worry the victims are long forgotten but I feel like if someone is talking about them, then they're still here with us. So again, thank you. Hit the like and subscribe if you're so inclined. And remember to take care of yourself, look after others, because I do care about what happens to you. Goodbye.